Hi, my name is Andrew Parker. I'm the ESG Director and Operations Manager of the Rockies for SPL. Thanks for joining this presentation on responsibly sourced gas, a history, and a look ahead. Before we get started, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about SPL. We are an energy tick company with 75 years of experience. We have lab and field offices nationwide in every oil and gas producing region of the United States. We also have two international offices now in London, in the UK, as well as Perth, Australia. Through these offices, we offer three main lines of business in AIM business, which covers our field services, automation, measurement, parts, et cetera. We have our laboratory division, which does analytical testing of uh, various products, including wastewater, produced water, and hydrocarbon products like crude, natural gas, NGL, finished products like gasoline, diesel, and lubricants. So to start a, our presentation off talking about responsibly sourced gas, I feel like we need to do a few slides of setup to understand uh, why these ideas and concepts like ESG and responsibly sourced gas are becoming mainstream and vernacular of oil and gas conversations that seem to happen every day, whether it's on LinkedIn or at the water cooler. Uh, these are things that are continuing to permeate to the surface and, be, uh, surface and become more mainstream in our conversations. And when I think when we think about responsibly sourced gas, we should probably start off with just some basic fundamentals around why greenhouse gases and emissions matter. So most of you hopefully understand the fact that part of Earth's atmosphere includes gases that help trap heat and make Earth a more habitable place. So water is a great example. And I think uh, when we compare the climates of Houston and Denver, one can start to appreciate what uh, greenhouse gas of water vapor does to keep warmth in the air. But there are other natural greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that contribute to this warming effect. And a few of those humans can influence. So the two most common you've probably heard of are CO2 and methane. So the way it works is that the sun's rays warm earth and earth emits some of that warmth back into the solar system as IR radiation, infrared radiation. And molecules like CO2 and methane, they actually emit and abs they absorb heat within the IR spectrum. So when we're thinking about the wavelength of that, that IR radiation that's being emitted from Earth back into space, molecules like CO2 and methane actually absorb within that range. And when they absorb that radiation, it excites them and they start to emit their own IR radiation in different directions, but it's not all pointed towards uh, the top of the atmosphere. Some of it radiates back to earth. And that's what leads them to, like water vapor, have a, a temperature enhancement effect on the planet. The other reason we care about them is because through combustion and other sources like agriculture and melting of permafrost, both natural and unnatural processes, these are more easily influenced uh, in the atmosphere than say water vapor. So I'm a climate scientist by education and I am required to show at least one graph of squiggly lines per presentation. And so for this one, I chose uh, what I hope is a fairly simple um, graph of uh, historical CO2 from the Vostok ice core in Antarctica. And so what happens here is that Basically, ancient air is trapped within the, the molecules of snow and ice, and then once an ice core is drilled and dated, scientists can then extract that ancient air and reconstruct what the CO2 was like many hundreds of thousands of years ago. So for this graph, we're looking at about 400,000 years of historical CO2, and I think you'll notice a, a, few, uh, a few different uh, patterns right off the bat. The first is that uh, CO2 never went above 300 parts, and it never went below about 175 parts in the last 400,000 years. And there's a cyclicity to it, right? For many natural reasons, like Earth's orbit, um, you see that um, these 
these periods of high CO2 are very short, and then it's characterized by a steady decrease, a low period, and then a very abrupt increase. And when we, I show this, I show this not so much as to get into the whole climate science debate of ESG and emissions, but rather as a source of, of where some people get their talking points from when they say emissions and CO2 and greenhouse gases are bad. Because if you look at the red line and you see where we are today, you would see that the levels we are experiencing as humans are very unnatural within the context of the last 400,000 years. And we can zoom into that period a little bit more and translate this. So I could overlay a temperature map and you would see that CO2 tracks with global temperature. And so what you'll notice from the second graph I just popped up, which shows temperature anomaly, is that the temperature anomaly or the degree, the magnitude of warming relative to the period in which the scientists in this graph normalize their data to is very significant. And I think if you kind of fit it into the context of periods where ancient civilizations, like during the medieval times when they write about the medieval warm period or the little ice age, those periods of noticeably different climate don't really even show up on this graph relative to the increase that you see at the very right of the graph. And that's where I think a lot of people get their, their alarm from. And like I said, I'm not, I'm not talking about this more to get down the rabbit hole of climate change. It's, it's to set it up, to set up the point that um, this is where a lot of the conversation gets driven from when we think about uh, why people care so much about climate change. The whole debate about the climatic consequences and the understanding to which we know and the confidence that we know these uh, catastrophists and climate alarmists will talk about, those are far less understood and those are far less constrained. And that's not the point of this topic. But this was just to show where some of the, the emphasis on why people are so worried about um, emissions and why people are so worried about greenhouse gases. This is where this is where some of the ammunition comes from. Okay, and when we're thinking about emissions, CO2, methane, greenhouse gases in general, we can kind of look at sources in the United States. And so, as of 2019, um, transportation led the way in terms of CO2 pollution to the atmosphere. So, driving your car, truck, planes. Etc. Transportation in the United States was the main contributor of CO2 to the atmosphere, and then right behind that, pretty close second is electricity, um, and then industrial uses, residential, and so forth. I would argue that on this pie chart, electricity is probably the single biggest and most important piece, and the reason is because unlike natural resources, renewables, unlike hydrocarbons. Electricity is not something that we, it's not a natural resource. It's not something we find. It's something we make. And so if we, we can electrify as many cars and we can electrify buildings and, and manufacturing, but if we don't have a way to generate electricity cleanly, then what's the point? And so when you look to how that energy electricity electricity is created in the United States, we see that about 40% comes from what would be considered clean, clean or cleaner energy sources like renewables and nuclear. And then about 60% comes from hydrocarbon sources like coal and natural gas. In recent years, there's been a push and it's kind of evident by this graph that Starting around 2005, 2010, coal starts to really decline in terms of its use in generating electricity, and it's in favor of natural gas. And the reason that's important is because natural gas burns more cleanly. So if we look at how many pounds of CO2 per million BTU is emitted by coal, depending on the type of coal you're looking at, it's anywhere between 216 and 230 pounds. Whereas when you look at natural gas, it's actually 50% less. So, so we emit 50% less CO2 than, than coal. And so this has been a really big argument and for 
converting more coal plants over to natural gas and the arguments for natural gas as a transitional fuel going forward to help solve some of these emissions problems that we're dealing with because it, it burns so much more efficiently. However, in recent years, we've seen more attention get paid to methane. And in particular, natural gas has been under question recently because yes, it might burn cleaner, but if we if we consider the methane emissions that are released to the atmosphere through the production process of getting natural gas out of the ground and processed, is it really that much cleaner? The reason methane has become public enemy number one is because methane is far less significant in terms of volume in the atmosphere, only about three or four parts per billion, whereas CO2 is well over 400 parts per million. But methane is far more of a powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. So methane has about 80, 80 times, uh, it's about 80 times a stronger greenhouse gas than CO2. And so this has raised a red flag with proponents of the oil and gas industry that say, hang on a second, natural gas is, is not as clean as you say, because you guys aren't considering all the methane that's being emitted to the atmosphere from producing that product. So I picked out a bunch of some of my favorite uh, headlines that I've seen over the last year or two. Um, this one most recently, the end of natural gas has to start with a, with its name. And uh, basically this, this, uh, this article argues that um, natural gas is a natural and that um, the industry is using the word natural to kind of disguise it. Which, uh, this article from Bloomberg back in January um, that basically tries to 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 talk about are we greenwashing um, when we we think about you know natural gas and responsibly natural you know responsibly sourced natural gas are we are we greenwashing? And then this one is is liquefied natural gas is is the boom on a collision course with climate change again in that article talking about the fact that natural gas and its associated methane emissions during production may actually not mean it's as clean of a fuel or possibly a viable transitional fuel as we thought. Here's another thing operators are having to deal with. With this attention being put on methane emissions in particular, we're seeing a huge demand uh, an increase in regulatory requirements on oil and gas operators. Most recently, we saw this uh, back in November when the EPA released their new uh, methane rules, which basically rewrite the Quad OA rule into Quad O B, Quad O C, and revise those requirements on a number of levels, right? So now, um, the increase, the you know, it increases the uh, frequency at which you have to perform LDAR inspections. It's adding in more equipment that are subject to inspection. It adds new performance standards for areas that were once never subject to regulation, like tanks and pneumatic pumps. So across the hydrocarbon value chain, there is this increased emphasis on making sure that you're, as an operator, doing everything you can to produce natural gas with as low of a methane impact as possible. And one way that we, we measure that is through methane intensity, which is just basically a measure of how much, you know, your volume of leaks relative to the volume of total throughput. So when we think about the need for transitional fuels the increased attention on oil and gas industry and hydrocarbon products in general for the role they may play in climate change and the need for cleaner transitional fuels because of that and this increasing burden of regulatory requirements from the EPA and other bodies, that's where we land at responsibly sourced gas. So what is responsibly sourced gas? Responsibly sourced gas I like to think of it as like an organic stamp on the natural gas that you could or 
you could be bringing into your home, right? So it's it's gas that's produced to the highest environmental standards and verified by an independent third party accrediting body. And we'll get into some of the accreditations here in a few slides. But responsibly sourced gas, I think, presents an opportunity for the industry to turn what many look at as a burden on the industry into a potential opportunity. And the reason for that is because responsibly sourced gas is one way that operators can achieve a return on investment for some of the efforts that they're putting into emissions reduction and measurement. So point in case, this study from Darcy Partners surveyed a variety of different operators and asked them, are you thinking about certifying your natural gas? Basically, three in every five or 60% said, yeah, we're, we're looking to try to get some type of certification of our natural gas in the next two years. Surprisingly, 30% actually didn't have plans to do that, and then 12% already had. So they were asked then, why? Why do you want to look at getting your gas certified as responsible? A lot of them said regulatory. Um, a lot of them said accounting, right? Not not losing you know, the, the not losing as as much uh, gas along the the production chain and uh, increasing your throughput. Um, and uh, some not some are doing it just because maybe markets or or investors are are asking them to do it. Um, there's a number of different reasons, but I think more what we're seeing now is an economical uh reason for people to do this so a couple recent articles highlight the premium that some operators can start to get we've seen deals with excel and other utility providers where now they're starting to they're starting to ink contracts where they're buying certified responsibly sourced gas at a premium anywhere from three to seven cents per mcf which if you know upwards of 15 so depending on what the price of the commodity is being traded at roughly about a five to ten percent premium um even 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 beyond just the the premiums that some utility providers are starting to pay for in the united states i think you can look abroad and look at supply and demand and carbon tax situations internationally and start to really see where maybe the appetite for uh, responsibly sourced gas is coming from, right? So when we look at Europe in particular, the United States is the largest exporter of liquefied natural gas, and Europe is the second largest consumer. And what that does is that means that um, in the EU in particular, they're facing a bit of a conundrum because there's a legal cap and trade framework in place. And what some operators in the United States, some that I've spoken to think they can get up to a dollar premium because of this, because they want, they want it's still cheaper for them to pay a premium on LNG that's certified clean than it is for them to buy a standard LNG cargo with, uh, that was produced with a higher methane intensity and then go buy carbon credits to offset the impact that that offload would have. And so I've, I've had a couple conversations with some producers who have basically said that they want to, they want to achieve responsibly sourced gas certification because they want to then liquefy it and send it to Europe where they can get an even bigger premium on that than they can uh, just selling it to a utility provider within the United States currently. Another argument would be, well, what happens when everyone starts producing responsibly sourced gas and does that premium go away? That's yet to be seen. But I think there's one other argument that should be considered, and that is that based on uh, projections from various sources, implementing responsibly sourced gas strategies along the production chain of one's operation is actually far less expensive than it, the alternative. So continuous monitoring technologies end up 
costing a couple extra cents per MCF of gas produced. Relative, right? So producing, so you know, think of this as producing gas with a very low methane intensity. The cost is actually a lot less than producing gas at a high methane intensity, especially when we start thinking about possible carbon, the cost of carbon down the road and carbon taxes. Uh, I know the some of the carbon taxes associated with the Build Back Better plan have raised some eyebrows. And so even if that premium goes away, the cost to produce natural gas is still far lower, assuming some of those frameworks are implemented, than if you produce high methane intensity natural gas, and then you have to pay taxes on that. So how does responsibly sourced gas accreditation work? So generally, there's three frameworks I'm going to talk about in the coming up slides. I'll have some of the similar elements, and, and the, they, they differ, obviously, a little bit as well. But a big piece of, of them are the leak detection and emissions quantification technologies. So what? how are you tracking your emissions now? Are you tracking some of your worst or highest producing sites with continuous monitoring? Do you have plans to implement continuous monitoring? Similarly, data collection. Um, how is data collection being done? How do you preserve the records? Um, how do you make the, the data transparent? How do you use it? How does it roll up into your inventories? ESG is very data intensive and responsibly sourced gas is no different. And then many RSG certification programs want to know more about policies and procedures that are already in place or being implemented when it comes to uh, like LDAR programs. So what is your policy when you find a leak? How do you repair it? How do you document it? How are your people trained to respond? So on and so forth. And then this comes to a head typically through a third party certification that's going to come in and look at your facilities and they're going to look at your paperwork and all the data that you submit and it's measured against a standard and then they will determine whether or not you qualify for certification or in a couple there's different grades of certification that you can achieve as you work on continuous improvement. But I think one of the point of the certification bodies and, and some of just the underlying principles of these certifications that they they really seek to seek to meet is that it promotes trust and transparency for the issue. I think this is a great opportunity, responsibly sourced gases, to create uh, to to produce a product in a transparent manner that um, consumers can feel comfortable in consuming. Um, it needs to be actionable for companies of all sizes to implement economically. Um, it's not, it wouldn't be, uh, I think, a beneficial standard if only the major players could implement it and smaller players could not. It needs to be something that's economical for all. And uh, really, RSG certifications should, sh should align with current regulatory requirements. They should be crafted with enforcement in mind. So the first certification program I'll touch on is the Trustwell certification, which is a comprehensive assessment that looks at a number of factors. It's, it's a uh, very quantitative analysis. Producers have to submit quite a bit of data. They look at um, a wide range of parameters that includes water, um, environmental policy, um, they look at company policies, et cetera. And they have a rating system that they've they've developed based on the criteria that they've developed. Project cert, this Trustwell certification is administered by, by Project Canary and by Project Canary employees. And they have implemented a grading rubric, basically, that they will give you a silver, gold, or platinum rating based on how your scoring falls into uh, their rubric. The next certification that I wanted to touch on is the MIQ certification, and this is a, a partnership. It's a kind of a public profit, uh, public 
uh, private nonprofit, there we go, a partnership between RMI, which is the Rocky Mountain Institute, and System IQ. And this is more of a qualitative um, certification. It requires significant auditing and review and engineering reviews of uh, your, your internal um, processes, your facility engineering. Um, doesn't necessarily require direct measurement, um, but methane intensity, your company practices, and your monitoring plans are all key are all key pieces of the accreditation process with MIQ approved auditors who are independent of the standard. Lastly, we have the equitable origin. Um, standard, which is similar to MIQ, but has an increased emphasis on the social governance issues um, like indigenous people. And the way that this this one works is actually you do a self assessment first, and then that is then assessed by an equitable origin auditor. You then take that auditor's feedback and you create a continuous improvement plan. And then based on your response, in the continuous improvement plan, the certification decision is based on the recommendation of the auditor after that peer review occurs. So if we kind of look at them side by side, um, all of them are a little the same, all of them are a little different. Some of them have a point of emphasis uh, on something in particular, uh, indigenous people and social for equitable origins, methane intensity for MIQ, um, and environmental for uh, the trust well certification. Um, one other in the works that I wanted to highlight about, and this is brand new, uh, and this is an industry led effort to redefine responsibly sourced gas criteria and certification. And so the GPA Midstream Association, which is the main midstream body in the United States, has created a new greenhouse gas measurement committee that's focused on helping to fill the gaps where regulation lacks. And one of the initiatives of this new group is to draft an industry-led standard for responsibly sourced gas. And really the goal here is to maintain the high environmental standards that have been set forth by previous frameworks, but takes a slightly different approach in that it's performance based and it's technology agnostic. And so those are some of the differentiating factors that that group will be working on in the coming months to a year to come up with a standard that the industry actually has say on that's actionable, it's achievable, it's economical for producers of all sizes and not just large, large tier one organizations. Another nice thing about this standard will be that when I say it has industry input, it will have input from bid streamers, it'll have in, uh, uh, input from producers, it'll have input from vendors, data companies, software companies. It is a collaborative effort leveraging the subject matter expertise of the industry to create a one of the kind uh, and, and really what we hope will become the industry uh, the, the, the measuring stick for the industry going forward when it comes to uh, responsibly sourced gas production and certification. And so with that, I've made it to the end of my slides. Just to wrap up here, we talked in the beginning about pressure from climate activists that have made emissions from oil and gas production facilities public enemy number one. Well, natural gas emits 50% less CO2 than coal when burned, its association with methane during the production and treatment process has some people questioning how truly clean it actually is. So responsibly sourced gas is a potential answer to that, where natural gas is produced according to a set of standards with uh, environment in mind. It presents an opportunity for operators to deploy these methane uh, emissions monitoring and reduction efforts while getting an ROI on their capital. 
And there's numerous certifications that we just covered that exist for people to explore these RSG options while a new industry-led effort is currently underway. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I look forward to answering questions in the Q&A session. Thank you.